there's, there's, there's a couple of little magical things about yoga that people don't really see from the outside. And um, the biggest one is it works on your nervous system in a way that other movement modalities don't do quite as well. But the other thing comes right back to what I said before is there's this community, which you get in other things like CrossFit and other places too, but the, the community thing's so important. You just, we're, we're all the product of our environment. We're so influenced and influenceable. Like just to have a group of people who for five minutes after class go, hey, like, what are you up to? I'm buying this like organic cocoa nibs. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> Somebody who's not just, you know, sniffing lines in the back room of a bar. Like it just makes a massive difference. It just makes a massive difference. And it's surprisingly hard to find. And w wherever you are in the world, it's, it's easy to make unhealthy friends. And it's hard to have a group of people who, who applaud growth and success and balance and health. And so for me, that was a huge part of it. Welcome, Lucas, to the Anonymous Third Podcast. It's great to have you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So I, I love your story. Um, read, a, read a lot about you. I know you and I, you and I have talked one time before. The thing that kind of sticks out to me is um, your growth over the last, I'd say, two decades and where you came from is very similar to, I think, where a lot of people kind of get stuck or a lot of people are. And, uh, and I'd love to start this conversation off with, um, with you in 2002 in New York City and how, uh, how, you were, you know, how your life was, was back then and what got you to where you're at today, which we'll, we'll definitely get into. But, it, but I'd love to start there because I think pe a lot of people can relate to that point. Sure. Yeah, I would say that like, uh, a lot of health changes usually happen, unfortunately, from a health scare. And for a lot of people that happens in their 50s or their 60s, they have their first heart attack or they get a type 2 di diabetes diagnosis or something like that. And in some ways, I was really fortunate to have kind of a health crisis really early. I was in my early 20s because then you can start making changes at a time when your body responds so quickly. And it's never too late. You can still make changes. But, you know, when you're 23 years old, your, your body really reacts pretty quickly. But um, long story short is I was living in New York City and I was working in publishing and I was in my early 20s and I had a corporate job and a pretty decent salary at the time and New York City was buzzing and I just didn't really, just couldn't really figure out what to do with myself. I, I didn't know what to do with my career. I didn't really have a very good social group. I didn't, just, just kind of quintessential young adult lost sort of thing. And I just started going out like a lot, like drinking a lot, using drugs and alcohol, just a lot. And I guess people say like everybody in their early 20s drinks a lot. That's totally normal. I guess the difference is, you know, I was alone a lot. Uh, I was in my room a lot. It was day and night all, all the time. And I would buy alcohol in handles. And if you're wondering what a handle is, it means your alcohol bottle has a handle on it. <laughs> <I'd buy laughs> one, of, one of scotch and one of vodka every day and I'd walk home from the liquor store. Sorry, not every day, every week. And I would, I would go through those in, in a week, you know, a handle of vodka and a handle of scotch. And you would you and drink by yourself? I drink by myself, I drink with friends, I drink at happy hours, I drink all the time. And um, so it, it's different. Every, you know, everyone in their early 20s drinks and then there's people who drink for parties and then there's people who drink for parties and for themselves and all of the above. So I drank all the time. And, um, and you know, you kind of make these transitions. You start with beer and wine and then you transition to mixed drinks and then pretty soon you don't want anything in that cup except ice and sometimes you don't even bother with the ice. Um, and, you know, if I didn't have a drink by about five or six o'clock, I'd start to tremble a little bit. And I was drinking so much that it was really hard to wake up in the morning. So I started using pseudoephedrine, which for anyone who's watched like Breaking Bad, it's like a precursor to speed. It's considered like trucker speed. Back then it was semi-legal. So I would take, uh, I don't know, I'd take uh, pseudoephedrine three times a day. There, so wasn't that the stuff that was in like hydroxycut back then and some pseudoephedrine? I think so. I think so. I don't know. Uh, I used to call them big reds. I used to get these big giant... Uh, red ephedrine pills, but I think it was probably in some of those, yeah, bodybuilding pills and things like this. Um, so yeah, so three times a day, I take pseudoephedrine, which uh, just makes you completely cranked up. It's very similar to like a methamphetamine or something like that. And then I started developing anxiety. So then I started taking clonopin, off-label clonopin use, which um, uh, benzos for people who know the whole category of 
of drugs. So that, that was kind of like my day, right? I, I'd drink myself to sleep every night. I'd wake up and take pseudoephedrine. And then sometime in the early afternoon, I'd take some clonopin to sort of deal with my anxiety. And most of this was alone. And most of this was for, for no good reason. It's not like I was, you know, getting abused or it's not like I had some terrible childhood or anything like that. It's just, I don't know. I don't know. I just got spun out, couldn't figure out what to do with my life. And um, the anxiety and the nervousness and the worries about that. And I, I'm not sure that just got sucked in. And, um, and before I knew it, that was like my whole life. I, I, the, the story I always tell where I really knew things had gone sideways because it, it, it's interesting, you know, when you do things that are bad for your health, you make friends right away and people don't really talk about this and you don't make good friends, but you make like flighty friends. You know, you have your happy mm -hmm. hour friends and the drinking friends and the house party friends and the cocaine friends and, um, it's nice to have a lot of friends and it, it feels good. You get a lot of really, really positive, uh, you know, high fives for doing really bad things with your life. Um, you know, it's pretty rare that, you know, before you and I started this, we were chatting about running. I don't have a lot of those conversations, you know, what people want to chat about is like, you know, the, their, their drinking party on, on the weekends mm -hmm. and things like this. And so, um, yeah, I would bounce around and I was, I was doing all these things and just trying to figure it out. And at the time I knew when things were really going sideways is I used to work at Scholastic, which is a big children's book publisher in New York City. They publish Harry Potter and Clifford the Dog and stuff. And I had a, it's down in lower Broadway, and I had a ID card to get into the building. It's at 555 Broadway. And it is a magnetic ID card. And the photo of me, I had to go down to the basement to the HR department to get a photo taken, and they must have done 15 photos. I just couldn't get over how bad I looked. I just looked like a bloated, pale, white whale, just puffy, red eyes. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't get a good photo. So in order for me to actually carry that ID, I bought a special bag that had like an ID holder and I flipped it backwards. That was like the only way, that was the only way I could come to grips with that. I couldn't look at that ID every day. Like I couldn't look myself in the mirror, essentially. And that's kind of when I realized that things were going sideways when, when you know, you can't look at your own your own face. Um, and so I started to think of, thinking about kind of cleaning up, started thinking about changing my life, but I didn't have any reference for that. I didn't have a social group for that. I hadn't discovered yoga, hadn't really found anything. And um, like a lot of things in my life, I just kind of gravitate towards extremes. And so I was visiting my parents in, they lived in Southern California at the time for the Christmas holidays. And this was right after September 11th. And I was downtown and neighborhood was shut down and dust in the apartment and all the trauma that comes with that. And so I thought, you know, if, if there's ever a time, now is the time, you know, I was drinking on September 11th, you know, down below Chamber Street. I was like, now is the time. So um, I flew to my parents and I remember I had a fifth of, fifth of scotch that I kept, well, multiple fifths of scotch that I kept carrying around, but I was like, let me at least get off some of these pills. So I, I stopped taking the pseudoephedrine and I stopped taking the clonopin, which I thought was the least worrisome. Didn't know anything about benzos at the time. They've had a lot of publicity now. Mm -hmm. Some listeners will know that like Jordan Peterson got hospitalized coming off of clonopin, these kinds of things. I never heard about any of that stuff. I didn't know that there was any kind of adverse reactions. Anyway, I went cold turkey off clonopin and I ended up having a grand mal seizure in front of my parents. And so uh, we were down at Dana Point Harbor and um, I don't remember, I remember getting out of the car and then I remember waking up in an ambulance on the way to Laguna Beach Hospital. And um, I, I, it wasn't so much the health scare, but just like the humiliation of, you know, convulsing for 15 minutes, freaking out my mom, freaking out my dad, pretty, pretty low, pretty low moment. Um, and no good reason for any of it. You know, no, there's no excuse for it. <laughs> like I, n nothing but a charmed life. Um, great parents, you know, good examples, uh, just all the opportunity in the world. And you just kind of have this moment where you're like, I've, I've really made poor decisions here, really made poor decisions. And so that kind of set me on a, on a path, just looking for something. It didn't happen all at once. And I certainly did come off the drugs and the alcohol. And I was, I was still smoking at the time and things like this too. But um, little by little, I started figuring out a different way. And I, I stumbled upon a yoga studio in Spring Street in Manhattan. And I was like, this is horrible. I hate it. Let me come every day. And so I started going to yoga. In my early days in my yoga practice, I would get out of yoga and I'd go down on, it was on the second floor in Spring Street. And I'd go down to the floor and smoke outside the door. And the teachers would give me dirty looks and stuff. But um, very, very quickly that changed. Very, very quickly that changed. Within six weeks, I'd quit smoking, quit drinking, lost a ton of weight, like too much weight. My clothes were hanging off of me. And it really just kind of set me on this, in the same way people go in a negative spiral, 
set me on a pretty positive spiral that really I've been with a few bumps and bruises along the way. I've been really riding ever since. And at that, at that point, did you quit drinking and everything else after you were hospitalized? Uh, I did. Yeah. I, uh, no, I did, definitely didn't quit drinking. The drinking took different times and I've definitely had problems with alcohol at other times since. Um, but I, uh, I definitely stopped taking pills and I definitely quit smoking within about six weeks. The drinking thing took longer. Um, by the end of that first year, so let's say by the end of 2002, uh, I was mostly sober and I wasn't buying liquor and handles anymore. I was drinking socially. I wasn't drinking at home alone with <laughs> you know, yeah. a bottle, a bottle next to the bed. And so the behavior had changed, but, um, but yeah, so it happened, it, it happened mostly mostly all at once, but, um, there, there was some gradual changes, but, um, mostly it was a big, big shift of my social group, my friend group, my activities. When you had that, that seizure, did, did, the did your parents or, you know, right away what it was from? I, I could imagine if you didn't have that information or, you know, back in 2002, it obviously wasn't as, um, uh, as easier, as easy to access as it is today. And you might not know those side effects without, having to look, you know, somewhere else other than, than online. Yeah. So like, did you know instantly that, that, that was the result? Um, of no, I, well, no, that's not true. I, I didn't know that it was benzos. I didn't know that it was clonopin. And, um, but I knew that it was related to the way that I was treating myself. Um, but I didn't tell anybody, Joe, I didn't tell anybody until about two years ago. Um, not a girlfriend, not a brother, not, I didn't tell anybody. Mm. Uh, that, that, that's how level, in fact, I'm, I think I'm not red in the face now, but usually when I tell this story, I get red in the face with humiliation. Like it, it's a really dark moment for me. And so, um, yeah, I never told anybody until, yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, I was on a podcast like this and somebody, somebody just randomly pulled the story out of me, but, um, no, it, it was really, really an important moment for me because it was so deeply humiliating. It was such a, there's such a, is the complete opposite of who I thought I was and who I should be and all the privileges I've had in my life and to end up twitching in front of your parents on the ground. It's just, it, it was really quite a moment. And so, um, no, I, I think I got pretty honest with myself internally, but honest with the world that took some time. Was there anyone at that point that you saw that had inspired you that was like, even though your peer group wasn't into health and they were into partying and a lot of people yeah. can, can uh, relate to that. Was there someone that you looked at or that a book you read or podcast well probably not a podcast back then but like yeah anything else that like the light bulb went off as well and you're like man I'd rather be like that person than like I'm living right now yeah it's just it, I met a girl basically and she took me to my first yoga class and she introduced me to healthy food and these kinds of things and um this is why I always tell people like if you're if the person you're sleeping next to you in your bed is not on board with whatever you want to do you're screwed like you can have all the best information it, it's such a harsh thing to say but it's just so true, the, uh, like a supportive social group and especially a supportive partner that will trump any nutrition plan, any diet plan, any exercise plan, any best trainer. Like you've got to have somebody who, who just says like, great job. Like you, you know, and, and so that was it for me without her. I don't think any of this stuff would have happened. I probably just would have, I probably just would have tapered off or gone in a different direction. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it was really a big, big influence on me. We, you know, we spent five years together. We traveled around the world and um, yeah, really, really had a massive influence on my life more than anything, just for like holding space for me. You know, she, she'd stay with me when I'm puking in the corner and, you know, she really put up with a lot initially and I uh, hope it was worth it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, have, have a lot of thanks to, to her for sure. Yeah, what's what's so unique about the the story that I want to get into now is the the yoga aspect of it. I and mean, most mm. of the time, I don't hear someone going to yoga and losing a ton of weight. And you know, I yeah. it to me like I associate that more with flexibility, more of like you know, you you get more um, present, uh, and meditative, and certainly I know yoga. Uh, there's yoga classes I've done that are ridiculously hard, and I can't do half the poses <laughs> like I should. Uh, so, so it's not that so much. It's more of like, that was your thing. Like you found that and you just ran with it. So like, so how did you get so attached to yoga practice? You know, it kind of comes back to what I was chatting about before, you know, even at my worst when I was, uh, uh, just all cranked up and drugged up and stuff like this. I would still go to the gym every day. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I started when I was 19 or something like that. And, um, I had some, some routine that I would do. I would do like 
20 minutes on the Stairmaster and then I do some lap pull downs or I don't know, I had some, <laughs> yeah. some, some crazy thing. And, you know, to my credit, probably kept me, kept me going, you know, um, um, you really, really kept me going. But the thing about yoga, there's, there's, there's a couple of little magical things about yoga that people don't really see from the outside. And, um, the biggest one is it works on your nervous system in a way that other movement modalities don't do quite as well. But the other thing comes right back to what I said before is there's this community which you get in other things like CrossFit and other places too, but the, the community thing's so important. You just, we're, we're all the product of our environment. We're so influenced and influenceable, like just to have a group of people who for five minutes after class go, hey, like, what are you up to? I'm buying this like organic cocoa nibs. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> Somebody who's not just, you know, sniffing lines in the back room of a bar. Like it just makes a massive difference. It just makes a massive difference. And it's surprisingly hard to find. And wherever you are in the world, it's, it's easy to make unhealthy friends and it's hard to have a group of people who, who applaud growth and success and balance and health. And so for me, that was a huge part of it. Do you, do you recall like your first gathering with, with uh, your, your fellow peers from, from yoga that you were just either eating somewhere unique or someplace you hadn't been and felt like out of like an out of body experience or like, you know, like what, like how am I even here? Yeah. I mean, I, I, so this same girlfriend with, with whom I made quite a big transformation, she dragged me early on. This is before I'd cleaned up. She dragged me to like some David Wolf raw food lecture in, in, uh, in Chinatown in, in New York. And David Wolf back then had some interesting information. He's gone completely like off the rails and he's talking about like <laughs> aliens and conspiracy <laughs> theories. And uh, I mean, please don't look him up. You, you will go down a rabbit hole. You do not belong. But um, he was quite an inspiring guy back then. He's, he's really a dynamic speaker and stuff. He's just like a lot of these online people, they just go completely off the rails. But um, she dragged me to this lecture and uh, two things happened. So first of all, she dragged me to this lecture. We had to sit on the floor and I couldn't sit on the floor because my hips were so tight. So I was all hunched up to the point where I was sweating. I like sweat through my shirt and you know, it was like one of our first dates and I was really embarrassed. And the second thing that happened is I brought a takeout margarita to the health food lecture <laughs> and it didn't even dawn on me till like 10 minutes in the irony. And I realized, you know, I was the only one drunk in the audience and these people don't go out drinking every night. And um, and we were also with this couple and I'm forgetting their names, but, um, they were a couple years older than us and they were just like healthy and happy and in love. And I just like, I just, I just wanted that. I just wanted that this, they were really nice. She was a cook and he was a chiropractor and he had some muscles and she was cute and, but not, not like a, not like a, just like a healthy glowing people. Right. You know, yeah. and I, I remember just sitting there and just thinking like, why, why aren't I doing that? Like, they look better than me. They're doing better than me. I'm sitting here with a foam cup with a takeout margarita, sweating through my shirt next to a girl I'm trying to impress. And I'm clearly not doing well. And so that was one of those moments where I just realized there's, there's, there's all kinds of different realities out there. If you keep your mind open to making a big pivot, because for me, it was a very, very big change. Yeah, I mean, maybe you were you were drinking because you were nervous and out of your element and going to somewhere foreign to you, and that's how you coped with things. I, I wish it was that simple, but I I, yeah. <laughs> I was up for drinking at any time. I was up for <laughs> drinking at any time. So, so from from that point, then was it like in my mind, I envision this like rocky moment with all of a sudden now your life starts changing. Was it like that, or or did it take? a long time and and what were some of those trials and tribulations along the way yeah it was, it was kind of like a rocky moment and um i i've one thing that i have learned is that people who change are people who change and people who don't change are people who don't change and and i am someone who changes and i continue to change throughout my life and so that change happened pretty fast i looked physically so different that even people i knew quite well would walk by me on the street i, I had lost that much weight and my you know, I had a jawbone and, you know, I look very, very different. Um, and so my whole life really got redefined. I think it was about six months. Well, no, I guess a little bit more, but within about nine months, I'd left New York and I started teaching raw food, nutrition, and healthy food and food prep classes and, and um, kind of ran around in, in Southwest and I was in California for a while. And then we ended up back, she and I both ended up back in New York for about a year before we ran off to Southeast Asia, a trip which I've never really come back from. But um, um, yeah, so things really, things really changed. I left my corporate job and that was kind of when I went out on my own. 
And that was a big deal for me to just to kind of cut off that safety net. You know, I had a good corporate job and I had a 401k and I had benefits and I was, uh, you know, it gave me quite a bit of social status and for better or for worse, as a young man to have a good job in a 401k, it, it means something and it, 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 um, it means something to you and it means something to your parents and your social group. And to cut that off was a big deal for me. And uh, I spent a lot of years really struggling just to kind of feel like, you know, I can, I can do this on my own. But yeah, within a year, within, within a couple of years of starting yoga, no, not even, about a year and a half after starting yoga, we left the country. And basically, I've been doing yoga, traveling, teaching really ever since. So we're 18 years later. It's a long time. Wow. So what, what uh, like, how did you go from just listening to a lecture, though, to like teaching about whole foods and uh, nutrition? I guess, I guess what happens is like, um, you know, if you, if you think about that couple I just mentioned, right, this like slightly older, just glowing, healthy couple, happy yep. couple doing interesting things. Like at the time she was like Seinfeld's chef. And I was like, wow, there's Seinfeld as a chef. And, you know, just, it, just like interesting, interesting life. And when you start doing things, when you start having passion, people are really, really drawn to you. And you're really passionate about whatever you could be passionate about. Like, I don't know, there's these kids here who do like razor scooters and they do backflips at the half pipe and you know there's a whole crowd of people around them how do you do that and so I lost a bunch of weight and people wanted to know like how'd you lose all that weight you you know I stopped drinking people said how'd you do that I want to learn how to do that so really it was inbound you know when I I I just got happy I fell in love I was I was walking around I was excited I was getting jobs I was getting gigs and um yeah it it was really inbound simply because I'd I found something that really worked for me and people noticed and it was dramatic. And so that's kind of how it happened. It wasn't really, I didn't really need to push that hard. People were coming to me. I was definitely not qualified, but I, I think you could probably argue that I'm still not qualified for, for anything that I'm doing. So I, who is though, you know what I mean? That's the, that's exactly. the exactly. funny thing about, about life. I remember life. in yeah. 2000, 2010, I got into digital marketing and I yeah. saw all these people that were self hurt proclaim experts and I was like how do you become an expert and then you start digging and you start learning and you're like huh I'm kind of an expert now too <laughs> you know like, like, <laughs> yeah. no one designates these things because you know a lot of this stuff isn't a perfect science and it's what works for you and what works for various businesses and as far as digital marketing to go back to that example you know it's all different so yeah. it's, it's uh pretty interesting so so I guess like when I think about the diet and how you transformed, were there, were there nights? Cause I know a lot of people, myself included, like I'll be, I'll be on a path and I'm great. And then there's a night I go off the rails and sure. then you start feeling guilty and you're, and then you start doubting yourself. And then maybe that second night you give yourself justification and say, okay, well, you know, since I screwed up the night before, I'm going to wait a few days or <laughs> I'm going to start next week. My wife and I were, notorious for this a few years back everything starts monday like hey you can do whatever you want today because yeah Mon- monday it's on and we used to do that all the time and and it and it eventually like that had to stop but it just curious like on how you uh if in fact during that time period did you ever um go off the rails on your program and then if so how yeah. did you get back yeah, I mean, I think like the blessing and the curse of my personality, maybe it's OCD, maybe it's hyper focus, I'm not sure, but I, I, it's easier for me to follow through than not. Um, it's so, so unpleasant for me to even think about like missing a day of exercise practice. It's so, so uncomfortable. It's almost like unfathomable. So that part is easy. Um, and the other thing is uh, with food, for some reason, food never did much for me. Uh, emotionally. It didn't fill the hole the way that chemicals do. And so like going off a diet program, I mean, I can eat whatever. Like if you told me, I mean, there was a whole, this is like years, is forever ago. I was 19 years old. I think I ate like balanced bars only for like <laughs> nine weeks or something like this. I, I can do any of this stuff. Like I have no problem. Like whatever. I can eat rocks. I can eat dirt. Don't care at all. I've never had a food craving. I don't wake up in the middle of the night, go to the refrigerator. I, don't, I just don't have that stuff. Um, but the chemicals, yeah. You know, walk by a bar, smell stale beer, it smells good. Cigarette smells good. Um, and so I definitely had some moments there where um, a couple of different times I've had alcohol problems. I guess one major one since I first quit and um, 
this was right after my second, uh, my middle son was born and he's 10 now. And he, when he was young, he was really, uh, he was a hard kid. He was a really hard kid. He had a bunch what, of things going on. What, what year was this? How long ago? Uh, he was born in 2011. And so, um, yeah, 10 years ago. Got it. And he had, he had a bunch of challenges. Uh, he, you know, he didn't look me in the eye, didn't speak until he was four, didn't really call me his dad until he was seven. So re- really a lot of challenges. And uh, so I started drinking really casually. At that time, I'd moved here to Spain as well. And they have good wine here and wine's cheap and cheap wine is good wine. So I started drinking wine a little bit and uh, somehow I kind of fall back into my old patterns. And, you know, a glass of wine a night turned into half a bottle, turned into 15 bottles a week. And um, one of my son's first words was daddy vino and vino in spanish is wine Mm -hmm. and it was another one of those moments where i was just like oh you know just just i don't think anybody could say anything worse than me than daddy vino you know and so um that was it that was really all i needed you know and so i haven't i haven't drank at all since then and you know alcohol is a funny one people can drink not drink learn how to drink It, it it's not a it's not a binary thing necessarily for people, but for me, the, those, those moments were such heavy moments that I've gotten off it. So definitely had some problems with alcohol a, a couple of different times and um, been a really long time, but I had a couple of, couple of bad nights on MDMA and these kinds of things, but that, that, was, that was ages ago. So for, for the most part, um, yeah, for the most part, really just enjoy being sober, being a dad, being, having, having energy. As I get older and older too, it gets easier to be sort of high, higher energy, you know, people, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm in my 40s now. A lot of people are going down. I feel like I'm even having more energy than I did in my 30s. So it's a, it's it's easier to be healthy in your, in your 40s, relatively speaking. So yeah, I think 40s is a it's a special time. I was just reflecting on that this morning, and and it's like you know enough about life to realize that we're not going to be here forever, and and you got to make yeah. the best of these moments. You have to be an inspiration to your family and, and your children, of course. And then if you can help others, that's a huge bonus as well. And, and so there's a lot of people that, that struggle. Life is not perfect. Life is complicated. It's not a binary thing. Yeah. And, and you yeah. ebb and flow and you get in and out of things and you want to start and then you fail and then you start and then you stop and you know the, the cycle continues and it's just about kind of getting back um, and having, having goals and, and working yeah. towards something. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to get into really kind of the, like how then you went from this healthy person to you moved to Spain. Now you started a yoga studio. You have, uh, been very successful in the, the yoga practice and very well known and, and kind of how, how that thing came to be. Was it similar to people seeking advice from you for, the way you transformed your, your physical body that people saw you doing yoga and wanted to learn more. What was that like? Yeah. So when I left, when I left New York, we went to Bangkok. And so I spent, um, spent a couple years in Bangkok, a year in Hong Kong. So a bunch of time in the South of Thailand in Koh Samui and up in North in Chiang Mai as well. And, uh, my first studio was actually in Thailand. When I got to Thailand, it was kind of like going back to the 1980s. So I landed in Thailand in 2003. It's kind of like going back to the 1980s in terms of health and wellness, in terms of information and, and products and just education. So I went from being, you know, uh, having, you know, 25 people in a lecture on a weeknight in the East Village in New York City to being on television in Bangkok. So it really just snowballed. Everything just snowballed. Everything was easy. I was doing menus for local spas and teaching big classes and didn't know what I was doing. And so I, I've really had a, a, just a blessed life. But I, I, one of the things I've done really well, I think mostly accidentally, is just had really good timing. And so I landed in Southeast Asia at a time when health and wellness was really just being born. I just kind of rode that wave for, I mean, really up until 2017, we were just on fire doing big events and training courses and I was on the news and I was at TV shows and private clients and all kinds of different things. But um, uh, yeah, it was really just kind of a slippery slide. Of course, there's all the personal challenges and things that go that come at the same time. But in terms of business and entrepreneurship, all that stuff was really just forced on me because I, you know, I've lived in countries where, you know, my Thai language is, is very poor. My Spanish is uh, kind of like George W. Bush's. You know, I can speak Spanish, but not, not, not at like a business level. And so, um, you know, it kind of limits your options. You have to, you have to really make your own way. So really just been forced into entrepreneurship. And I've mixed, I've mixed feelings about like the glamorization of the entrepreneur right now. I think most of us, 
uh, quietly suffer most of the time and, uh, you know, quietly wonder when nobody's watching, especially not our partners and our kids, if, if, it, if the trade-off was really worth it. Um, but that's kind of the path that I've taken on. And it, it, it's hard for me to complain about just because I've had such a, I mean, just by anyone's assertion, just, just a slippery slide of opportunity and, and, and uh, just a really gifted life in terms of the, the opportunities that have arisen. But yeah, I got into entrepreneurship because I had to. And so I needed to, in some cases, just get a work visa. And in some cases, I need to sponsor relatives and things for work visas, kind of typical immigrant story. And little by little, I've, I've learned to love business and I've become fairly competent at it and built a, a fairly lar- large organization. And it's kind of landed me where I am here today. Yeah, I want to dig in on that comment a bit about entrepreneurship. But before that, like, I'm so intrigued with building a business in another country or like creating a yoga studio. Like, how do you even go about that? Like, do you just walk down the street in Thailand and see a place and you're like, oh, that can be a yoga studio and like knock on the door? Like, how does that even work? Yes, yes, like that, like that. I think, you know, it's another one of like my special skills is like I have. I have no problem with rejection, like, like zero, zero. I, I, um, <laughs> I, 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 just, I, I get no's like all day long to the point where I just don't even, I don't even remember. I was at a business conference once and, um, I was sitting next to someone and we kind of struck up a conversation. I was like, Hey, it's really great to know you. Like, can, can I get your email or something like that? Maybe if we have a project together, she's like, we've talked on the phone. You tried to hire me like three different times. I was like, really? I can't even remember. She's like, I've said no every time. She's like, don't call me. And, um, <laughs> and I realized this is like so typical of my life. I'm pitching people constantly. Like I just don't stop. I don't care. Like I just don't care. Yeah. And so, um, I, you know, I remember when I was, uh, same thing. It was like when I was in New York city before I got clean, I had a friend named John and John always wanted to take me out with him when he went drinking. Cause he wanted to go meet girls. And I'm like an old fashioned guy. I've been in monogamous relationships since I was 17 years old. And I was like, yeah, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll go, you know, and I would just walk up to any girl and say, Hey, you know, I got my friend John over here. You want to come meet John? Yeah. No, no, no. And then, you know, and then John would get a girlfriend. And so, um, I, it's just been in my blood for whatever reason. I just don't mind. I just don't mind nose. I, I just try things all the time, all the time, all the time. Ask people who work for me. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know, crazy people I've had on my podcast just because I, you know, I find their email address, just cold pitch them. You know, I've yeah. chatted to CEOs of major corporations via email. They're like, how'd you get my email address? I was like, don't worry, just answer the email. And um, so that's what I did. Yeah, li- literally, I, I flew to Costa Mesa. I walked around. I found an empty space that looked good. I called the number in my broken tie and, you know, kind of talked it out and found somebody to give me a little bit of money and kind of went from there. They call it like the immigrant's edge and it's hard to kind of get perspective, but, you know, people wonder why like, I don't know, Nigerians do so well or like why the Vietnamese just like, just crush it in the U.S. It's like when your options are cut off, when your family support group is cut off, when you're looking out at the world and you're like, I can barely speak this language. Like there's this sort of mad scramble for like, you just get really honest. Like, what do I have to offer here and how can I make this happen? And it's weird to come from the U.S. where we're normally, you know, kind of on the other end of the spectrum. But, you know, when you land in, in Thailand, aside from having, you know, a couple of bucks, and I, I, I don't mean more than a couple of bucks, but in your pocket, you just don't really have any advantages. And so trying to figure that out, you get this immigrant perspective where you just look around, you realize, like, I got to figure out what I can do here really quickly or I'm going to get deported, basically. Yeah. So, what, what was something, once you got the business up and going in, in the studio, there has to be stories of things that happen with either the governance of oh, having a business in Thailand mm-hmm. or something unique, like what's something that sticks out to you? You know, I mean, all the, we, we live in this weird time period where every time I open up social media, there's somebody just glamorizing entrepreneurship. It's very strange. It's almost like glamorizing the first year of parenthood or something. It's like magical and horrific at the same time. You know, it's like 3 a.m. It's like the kid's crying. It's like, yes, it's wonderful. But uh, let's talk about in five years. I'll tell you it's wonderful. Right now, it's really difficult. And entrepreneurship is so much like that. It's so, uh, it's, there's so many late nights when you're all alone. Nobody wants to hear about it. Nobody wants to hear about it. I understand some people have partners who support them at a level where, you know, they really have somebody who has their back, whether it's a business partner or a um, a spouse or whatever. I never had that. It was just me. It was just me. And there's so many nights. It's 1130 and I'm trying to fix some server. It's 12 o'clock. Somebody's broken into a retail space or 
just alone, alone with very real problems, with very real consequences, which include feeding my family and feeding a whole bunch of other mouths that are depending on me and who aren't going to pick up the phone. <laughs> and, um, but one moment that sticks out is I had rented my very first studio is I rented a, a studio from a woman named Kunlek, uh, a Thai woman. And she and her brother had quite a contentious relationship. And she was a student of mine. In fact, she brought me like 25 members of my studio. And we had classes in Thai as well. And so after class, they're all hanging out, drinking coconuts and things like that. And her brother comes in and um, he comes in dangerous. He comes in dangerous and uh, comes in with a, a shotgun and just, just dangerous. I've, I've never been around that much danger. And, you know, this is a yoga studio. We have, you know, big fluffy couches and people drinking coconuts and they're all hot and sweaty from classes. It's like 30 women. And this crazy guy, crazy guy comes in with a shotgun, just dangerous on his face. And so that's about as extreme as it got. And, like you know, he's holding it, about. he's walking in like, like what was he going to do? Like how did that... <laughs> He definitely wasn't going to shoot his sister, but he definitely wanted his sister to know that he had a shotgun. And guns are very rare in Thailand. Um, so it was really, well, whatever. Nobody wants to see a gun when people are screaming at each other. Right. doesn't matter what country you're in. But, um, yeah, he just pulled up and he was fighting some family dispute, you know, typical thing. Land was inherited and, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of this beachfront land. Beachfront land used to be worthless because that's where all the fishing was. And then suddenly beachfront land becomes interesting when you know, things get developed and, um, yeah, just typical family feud, tam family dispute. But, you know, we talked him down off the ledge and little by little things got back to normal. Wow. That's, uh, that's fascinating. I'm sure you have a million more stories, but going back <laughs> yeah. to the, uh, entrepreneurship, man, I could, I could still relate. And, and sometimes you could have partners that it really doesn't help the like loneliness yeah, yeah. side of it. Like, it, yep. um, I have, a lot of the, those stories as well, but it's it is it's the iceberg kind of graph if you've s seen that or the picture where it's like all this stuff yeah. happens underwater and then what's visible is is you know just this small uh, small iceberg above kind of the waterline and um, and most of the stuff happens underground. And I would say that's those are the times when you're alone and and uh, I can completely relate to that. I I would have a thing that. Every day I would work after my family went to bed until my, my laptop died. So I'd have it fully charged. I'd work. <laughs> yeah. And the newer the laptop yeah. was, the kind of worse, worse that, it, that it got. But that was my, that was my limit. So, and then that could be until 1 a.m. sometimes. And, uh, and it would just be this thing over and over again. And your mind, like, is this worth it? And, uh, and you just develop this habit and you just keep going and going and going. And, you know, things take, Things seem to take a long time, but then they happen really fast. Yeah, and and that that to me is just entrepreneurship at its at its crux. And the reality of all of that is you have to be willing to put in the work, and you have to make peace with yourself that it is either going to be worth it. Or you're going to have to sacrifice other things, and I certainly did. I was not the father that I could have been. I wasn't the friend or even business partner because I was just. I had very little sleep, had, had a lot of responsibility, a lot of mouths to feed. I mean, the, the company got, say, 800 employees at, at, uh, at now, uh, essentially. And, and it's, yeah. it's a little bit different because, as you know, cash flow is so critical when you're growing a business, especially if you're a um, person that bootstraps your business, meaning yeah. you're not getting funding from someone else then cash flow is so critical. You could be a great business on paper and your P&L, profit and loss statement, can be excellent. But if your cash flow isn't there, then you can't pay your bills and then it's a downhill spiral. So you got to, it's not, it's not just a, a one-sided thing. You got to balance all of these things. And then at the same time, have a good culture and, and make people, <laughs> yeah. make people not stress that they're working for you. You know what I mean? So there's, yeah. there's just a lot. I'm, I'm curious, like what, when you made that comment, like, is this is this worth it? Is it that grind over time, or was there certain things that happened to you along the way that you look back and you're like, man, I don't think I could go through that again? Yeah, you know, I, I you know, I, I didn't have a choice, and I still don't think that I have a choice. I became unemployable. Not that I couldn't get a job; I could get a million jobs. It's just, um, you know, once you start down a trajectory of deciding your own fate, you kind of just can't go back. 
But I think for people glamorizing and setting out to be entrepreneurs, I really think they need to think through, because everything comes with a cost, like you said. Cost for me was pretty similar. You know, there, there, there's years of my, my older kid's life that I don't remember. There's uh, so many times, you know, I wasn't there for anything, any after school activity, times when I didn't know their teacher's name. I mean, so many things. And the question is like, yeah, w is the cost worth it? And I think a lot of us, at least me, I didn't, didn't sit down and do that like cost benefit analysis. And this kind of, uh, I don't know, masculine warrior, let me perform, let me be the provider and everything else goes to hell and that's okay because I guess I support the family and I guess they care about that. It's, it's, it's just kind of this weird, it's this weird stereotype that a, a lot of us just fall into without kind of a deeper analysis of, you know, what, what, are we actually, <laughs> what are we actually trying to do? Like is growth at all costs really important or is... I, I, I don't really know. And it's always easier to have some uh, deep thoughts with, with hindsight, with, you know, a little bit of perspective and in, in a kind of a cozy place where I find myself now. But um, it's really, there's been just a lot of moments where I just have to ask myself, is this really worth it? The, the I, I mean, years where I didn't watch a movie, years where I, I mean, zero social life, um, you know, didn't see friends, family for, I mean, huge swaths of time you know, 11 o'clock at the night, hands in your face, crying alone. I mean, these things, it, it just happens. And like, it's really, um, it happens to anyone who's running. You have to eat glass. Like, it's just, it's, it's running a business uh, for most people. Um, and so, I don't know. I, I hate these big corporations, but um, I hate these small corporations too. It's, re it's really hard. It's really hard to, have to, 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 to figure out a balance. And I think the most difficult thing, which kind of loops back to what we chatted about earlier, it's like, if you don't have a, a community which most entrepreneurs don't, meaning just someone you can call and just say, hey, my server's down, or um, I, I don't know, we got broken into, or we've had a hack, or um, you know, Facebook changes algorithm, or whatever it is. If you don't have some kind of community, somebody, some kind of safety net, not just financially, but emotionally, it's just pretty brutal out there. It's just pretty brutal. And I don't think there are really, at least I haven't found a whole lot of structures in place for small and medium-sized businesses to have that. They don't have a board of directors even. You know, it's just flailing around at night until their laptop battery dies like you were doing. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's right on. But now that you've kind of matured through, I guess, the first years of entrepreneurship, um, a decade or decades plus now, have hmm. you looked at like finding leaders to help you? Because that's, that's what I found is that the measure of success changed for me. And it was at first, it was me doing everything. I was running around like a madman and I would want to be there and make every decision. And I felt like I had to. And then I started to realize that the measurement of success uh, I was chasing was wrong. And, and mm -hmm. to me, success was creating the company and it living on as if I wasn't there. And that's, mm -hmm. and that, and then I took that a step further and told my team that and my managers is like, you need to create systems in your department in a way where it can operate as if you're not there. And that to me became a measure of something I started going after. And, and it's still, it's still something that's challenging, but it, it felt more scalable and it, and it gave me more of a relief that actually I don't have, have to do everything. And I want to find things I'm not good at to then give those things to other people. And a clear example of that was like, once we got past 250 employees, I was doing it. I would interview every single employee and I was like, just completely not present. You know, I would have to, I would be yeah. there and be in the moment, but I wasn't there necessarily. And I didn't want to be there. So I'm like, I'm not adding value here. This team is very capable of, of hiring people, but because I've always done it, I just kept doing it. And then finally one day I was just like, this isn't, this isn't worth it. Um, that said, like if, Someone's a direct report to me. Of course, I'm going to interview them, but like, I just I couldn't do that anymore. So I was just curious. Like, do you you think about it in that way at all? I mean, I guess there's. I definitely do think about it that way. I guess every business is different, and and the truth is, I've you know I've been in business for 15 years, I guess, and the reality is, I've been in a whole bunch of different businesses. Even though it might have the same name, we were doing different things at different times. And so some of the businesses ran mostly without me, some of them really heavily with me. So I think, you know, that, that is probably something I need to work on still. But um, I guess lately also, I just think more about the same thing. Like, 
does anybody care? And there's a lot of the stuff that I do in business also that nobody really cares about, meaning, you know, my, my litmus test is like when I tell my kids, can I even hold their attention for more than a few seconds? And there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really matter. And I feel like with my skill set, I should do things that matter. I feel like I got a little lucky in terms of horsepower between my ears and, and a little lucky, definitely very lucky with parents and education and stuff. I feel like I have a certain obligation to do things that are unique to my skill set. And so I think a lot about it from the client perspective. Like, am I doing stuff that actually moves the needle or am I just crowding a marketplace? And that's been kind of a new guiding principle that's really helped me a lot. And I spent many, many years hiding from clients also. And now I do tons and tons of front-facing client stuff. And that's really just, that's kind of served as my emotional support network too, just because I get overwhelming positive feedback, which is just fantastic. I guess for years I couldn't even, I just couldn't take it good or bad or anything. And, and mm -hmm. lately it's been really helpful just to kind of put myself out there more. Yeah, that's, that's great. So what is life look like for you now? You're, you're a dad of three children, mm -hmm. married. How are, how are things? Uh, you know, I think I, I, I really find it difficult to, something's always broken. You know, it's like health, wealth, relationships. One, one or two of those three are always screwed yep. up. And so um, I, I would say I'm in a good place, but uh, I pretty much just work, work out, and, and um, spend time with my kids. That's pretty much my entire life. And I could pretend that I do other things, but uh, all of it's pretty, pretty small. I watched The Squid Games, which was like the only show I've watched yeah. in 2021. Um, uh, literally, it's the first time I've watched Netflix in a year and a half. Um, but yeah, I just work, work out, and I do kids. And I find, I'm finding that extremely, extremely fulfilling for right now. But I'm also really actively planning for my 50s and actively thinking forward and really just constantly asking myself, is this worth it? And the pandemic for me forced us to shift everything and forced me to really rethink my whole life. And so um, in that rethinking, it, it, it's really helped me gain an urgency and a perspective of like really making sure what I'm doing makes sense because it not only might come all apart, it's very, very likely that it'll all come crumbling down and we'll need to make a pivot. And so um, the stuff that sticks with you is more interesting than the stuff that falls away. And when you're, uh, do you, you find at all that you're, I don't want to say the word sick of, of yoga or doing what you've done for the last two decades, but do you ever mm -hmm. get into, do you ever get an itch to say, oh, man, maybe I should, do something else other than base the business on yoga or base even your fitness routine on, on yoga? Sure. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, you know, I, I probably went through at least a five year phase where, you know, I would do my yoga practice in the morning, didn't have any interest in it. It's just like so mechanical. I didn't really do anything with my yoga business. I got completely focused on this other like mind, body, weight loss, publishing and conference business we were running. And yeah, I really put it on, on the back burner for a solid five years and I kind of thought I was done. Multiple times I kind of thought I was done. And I think one of the, the most challenging things, challenging thing for me is just, just trying to understand where I'm at right now in terms of my interest and what I really feel, like I mentioned earlier, just what, what's my unique ability? Where can I actually add value and not just crowd the marketplace? And it, took, it just took me so long, like embarrassingly long. And what I do now doesn't look that different than what I was doing 18 years ago, except for my approach to it and sort of my um, just, just, just game theory in terms of like what I'm actually doing. And for sure, my skills are better, of course. But I, it took me a really long time to kind of just say, huh, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. And I do that in unique and different ways. And sometimes I'm teaching staff and sometimes I'm teaching ad teams and sometimes I'm teaching breathing, sometimes I'm teaching yoga, but that's, that's what I'm doing. So let me try to be the best I can at that. And um, at least recently, and let's call it like two plus years, it's really just been lighting me up in a way that I've never, I haven't felt that kind of like work satisfaction in a really long time. So that, that's exciting. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. I, I come from a place where my whole young adult life, I played basketball, and then, and then mm. one day I just got so sick of it, and I, I haven't, yeah. I haven't watched it much. I haven't even played in decades now, really. I yeah, mean, yeah, I yeah. do some hoops here and there, but it's like, it's like sometimes you just get to that point, you're just like, yeah, I'm just, just done. done. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it's a little different because your business is is based on it, obviously, and you're you're doing very well at it. So, so a bit different there. Uh, two, uh, two 
last questions I have is, um, do you still walk? I mean, you're in a, you're in Spain, mm. and Spain still has cheap wine and still has really <laughs> good a really good fun social atmosphere. Yeah. Um, I guess the one the one thing I want to caveat, maybe Spain's I haven't been to Spain yet, but what I did notice about traveling is that many people treat drinking as like something you do with a meal and not necessarily just go out to bars and drink mm-hmm. to get drunk. Sure. Do you f- still find yourself like fighting that off or is it just like you don't even think about it anymore? Yeah, I don't, I don't think about it. It would certainly be helpful if I could drink a little bit just to be somewhat social, but, um, I just can't, I just can't be bothered. I can't get interested in it. Um, people want to talk to me about alcohol, quitting alcohol. I just, it's like you said with basketball, I, I'm just totally uninterested. I don't, I don't have anything to say, anything to preach, nothing. It, you know, I, I can tell you a story and then I'm done. I just don't, um, it just feels like that chapter. My, I feel like I drank enough. I did it. Yeah. It is enough. Yeah. Th- this concept I think is really, like you said, with basketball, it's really been something I've been thinking about is like, when is enough? And sometimes you get enough of a certain person, a certain job. I used to ride horses a lot, a lot, a lot. I was super into horses, cared for a whole bunch of horses. And then I don't, and I don't think about horses. I don't research horses. I'm, I'm done. It's enough. And with alcohol, I also feel like it's just enough. So um, yeah, I don't hear that siren song anymore. It's not interesting to me. Maybe someday, I'm not sure. But I, uh, I, don't, I, I don't have a single neuron that's thinking about it these days. Got it. You know, that, that makes sense. And good for you to just put that out of your mind. <laughs> um, now, uh, I guess last is, I can't help but think your friend in New York City that, hmm. that got you um, on a path. Do you keep in touch with her still? Uh, this woman, I haven't heard from her in many, many years, uh, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. But um, yeah, ho- hopefully someday I'll be able to thank her properly. Very cool. Well, hey, man, thanks for spending the time with me today. How can people find out more about you or get a hold of you if they, you know, you, you have such great life experience that, that I hate for someone not to reach out if they wanted to. Sure. Yeah. My site is just yogabody.com and I have a podcast, Lucas Rockwood show, and that's, you can pretty much find everything there. Cool. Hey, thanks a lot, Lucas, for spending the time with us today. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it.